Good afternoon, everyone, again. I'm Abby Chalpin, a partner at Shine Ring Australia, and I will be moderating today's PFA session on non-bank lending. Thanks for joining. It's great to see so many of you online. I think that this is going to be a great topic of interest for both property funds and non-bank lenders. With Australia facing a recession and Victoria's lockdown continuing, it certainly is a challenging time for businesses. This, of course, has had an impact on the property sector. Retailers are struggling to meet rental obligations with the lengthened shutdown, particularly in Victoria, and rents have declined in the office space as most people are working from home. These issues have put pressure on the banks, impacting loan terms and their willingness to lend for new investments. This certainly raises the question of whether there is an opportunity for non-bank lenders to breach the gap left by the banks. In today's session, our panelists will give us insights into the broad economic outlook, particularly for the property industry, what the current crisis means for the non-bank lending sector, and the challenges facing property fund managers. Our panelists, Nerida Conisby, Wayne Lasky, and Lawrence Copping, each bring a different angle to today's discussion. But before we start, I would just like to run through some housekeeping. We recommend that you click on the enter full screen button just at the top right hand corner of your screen to achieve the best webinar experience. If you click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, a window will pop up and this will allow you to send us questions as we go. We will monitor these questions and ask the panelists the questions throughout the presentation. Also, before we kick off, we are running three live polls today. The first poll question will appear on your screen now. I'll just give you a minute or two to answer that. And the poll questions will remain at the bottom, can be accessed using the poll button at the bottom of your screen um, for a while. Once you answer the question, it will disappear and we will share the results with you later in the session. Our first panelist, Nerida Conisby, is REA's group's chief economist and one of Australia's leading property experts. She has a regular column in The Australian and makes a weekly appearance on Sky News. Nerida has more than 20 years of property research experience throughout Asia Pacific, covering residential and commercial property from both an investor and occupier's perspective. Nerida, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure our attendees are keen to hear about your thoughts on the broad economic outlook for Australia, particularly for the property industry. Thanks, Abby. I'll just um, switch over to some slides. Uh, so they, so they uh, did that work? Hang on, maybe not. Uh, okay, so in terms of what's happening at the moment, uh, things are dramatically different uh, to, from uh, the middle of March. So obviously we all went into mo not lockdown in, in the middle of March. Uh, we are now six months into uh, quite different conditions and things are really far from normal. So there's a number of things that are happening at the moment. Uh, Melbourne lockdowns are obviously a really big issue. Uh, we have got relatively low infection rates across Australia. So that's been a, a very positive um, aspect of, of what's been happening. Uh, there was a lot of concern over the September cliff, which hasn't eventuated. So the big one being uh, the automatic mortgage payment freezes were, were meant to end. Uh, they haven't ended, but they, have, they are slowly being wound back. Uh, JobKeeper, JobSeeker is also being pulled back a little bit. We are, we are having a budget uh, in early October, so we will get a better idea as to how that looks going forward. Uh, things are opening up, very different in Melbourne compared to the rest of Australia, uh, but, but we are starting to, to work a little bit more normally, but still very differently from the way that we were doing pre-COVID. Uh, unemployment is still high. Uh, we did see some pretty surprising numbers today in terms of what's been happening uh, with, with unemployment. Uh, what is interesting is that a lot of the jobs that were lost early on in, uh, in the lockdowns in March, April, are now starting to come back. So, so that is a very positive um, aspect of the economy at the moment. 
Uh, international travel is a problem. We don't know what will happen with migration. I'll talk a little bit about that, that today. Uh, foreign students aren't returning and um, we are starting to see more positive signs around a vaccine. So, you know, I think that that is positive. Um, main thing though, predictions are very hard at the moment to, to give and conditions can change very quickly as we saw uh, in June. Things were looking overwhelmingly positive for Australia and then July we started to see things unravel in Melbourne which led to quite a different outcome. Uh, we are in a recession like no other. Uh, one of the things that is interesting uh, and which is determining the direction of the way things are moving is that we, we're not in a financial crisis. So very different to what we were seeing in, in the global financial crisis last decade. Uh, very different also to what was happening in the early 1990s. So we've gone into this recession with a, a pretty strong, or with a very strong banking system, with a government sector that's pretty cashed up. And that, um, that is leading to very, very different outcomes to, to previous downturns. Um, quite unusual things happening. The global share market had its strongest August since 1986 last month, uh, very much driven by tech stocks. So if you are employed in the, in the tech sector at the moment, you are looking quite, or feeling quite different about things compared to someone in hospitality. Uh, April is now considered to be the absolute low point for global GDP. Um, I, had a, I was in a presentation from the Reserve Bank today uh, they said the, the, the actual um, low point for Australia was, was hit in early May, so around May the 6th. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are back up, so it does show that there is a level of activity occurring around, around the world. So we did see this drop in emissions. People are driving more now, they're very nervous about public transport, so that, that is going to potentially shape our cities if we can't get people back onto public transport. Uh, very good conditions in mining, record level iron ore pricing. Uh, some record levels of iron ore exports to China. China is really picking up again, but there are some political risks around, around that. Uh, also, government is growing and um, particularly good for Canberra. The future is big government. You know, if you have a look at all that uh, stimulus that has been pumped into the economy, you do need a lot of people to distribute it. And, um, and as a result, we do expect a, a continued growth in, in the government sector. So good news for Canberra. Uh, Victoria is the outlier. Um, there will be bounce back without a doubt. We, you know, if we have a look at everywhere around the world where we did have such extreme lockdowns, uh, we did see a sharp recovery around um, in, in New York. We saw it in London. Um, you know, even even uh, in in the rest of Australia after that first lockdown, there was a huge recovery that we saw almost instantaneously. So so that will happen to Victoria. Uh, you can see here though that from what's been happening with payroll jobs, this is the data that we can get um, very um, quickly every week now from, from the ABS has been some adjustments in the way that they release data. Uh, but really accommodation and food services, you can see they're down nearly 40% since, since the middle of March and, and that is really the sector that has been hit the most. Um, a little bit of an uptick in finance and insurance sectors and a bit of an uptick in uh, gas and, and utilities, but overwhelmingly big drops everywhere. And Australia, um, Victoria really diverting from the rest of Australia as a result of, of what, what has been happening with the lockdown. Uh, in terms of property, um, it is surprising, or maybe not that surprising, but residential prices aren't dropping like you would expect. We are seeing uh, very strong conditions in premium markets around Australia. So if you were hoping to get a bargain in Albert Park or in Bronte, uh, you, you're not going to be that successful because we are still seeing a lot of money pumping into um, high-end residential. Uh, lots of reasons why. The market was very strong as we were entering into COVID. Uh, the market that has been hit the most has been the rental market. And I'll talk through some of the hard hit areas uh, in a sec. Um, but it has um, overwhelmingly, we look at job loss, it has overwhelmingly affected young people, overwhelmingly affected uh, the rental market as a result, but not so much the buyer market. Uh, six months mortgage payment freezes did prevent uh, fast falls in pricing. There's no doubt that people uh, aren't going, weren't, well, haven't been going into distress. Um, or, well, I mean, they probably, I mean, they are likely to have gone through some distress, but not the most severe levels of distress. Uh, we do have incredibly low interest rates, banks well funded, working with customers. Uh, so household savings rates are increasing. So it's been interesting looking at those because if you have a look prior to COVID, they were, they were at about 6% of household income. They, they, were 20, they are now sitting at around 20%. So if you have a job, you've, you're not spending much money because you can't travel, there's nowhere to go out and you're probably not dressing up very much. So, you know, there's a lot of money that is being saved and, um, and it is likely, at least some of that is being poured into to property. 
Uh, there is some concern about how much the banks will withdraw support. Um, at this stage, they do seem to be working with people and, um, and as a result, it is unlikely that they will be the instigators of a house price crash. Uh, in terms of the areas that there, there are or there is rising risk, uh, it is very much markets where we have seen very high levels of development. Uh, we, are, we have seen a big increase in, in new rental listings since the first lockdown, since mid-March in, in these suburbs. So these 10 suburbs account for half of all um, increases in rental listings. So the rental market has recovered in the established, um, in, in the housing market, but it is really the unit market where we're, we're continuing to see uh, rising vacancy. Uh, Melbourne CBD in particular is accounting for the vast majority of, of uh, vacant increasing uh, rental listings or increasing vacancies. So some really big challenges in that market at the moment, primarily because foreign students haven't returned and also because um, even local students, if they uh, were living uh, at, in, in these areas, they are likely to have returned home or, or to elsewhere because uh, our students, are, sorry, classes are mainly online at the moment. So these are the areas we've seen big increases in, in vacancy. Um, and these are the areas we're starting to see a lot of people appear to be selling out. So the, the, the areas that we are starting to see some really big increases in um, apartments for sale on realestate.com.au. So again, I've highlighted the areas where we're seeing the big increases in rental listings. Uh, these are the areas, they're the areas also we're seeing um, some, some pretty, well, some very big upticks in, in people selling apartments. So although we don't have those very um, most severe levels of distress, we've got very few mortgagee sales at the moment. Uh, there does appear to be a little bit of movement in, in the investor market in particular and very little activity from investors buying, uh, which, is, um, which is quite an interesting trend. Uh, in terms of what's going to happen in the future with new development, um, the big issue is around housing demand and, um, and, and particularly around whether migration will start up again and or when, I mean, it will at some stage, but when, when it will start up again. So at the moment, we don't have any really good forecasts at a small area uh, to, to kind of work out what's happening. The University of Queensland has done some research into what this year will look like. We don't get migration levels back and basically come up uh, with, with, the, um, with the forecast that we would have been 1.4% uh, population growth across Australia without COVID. Uh, but at this stage, worst case, we're looking at 0.4% growth. So that was last seen in, in 1916. So in some incredible changes to, to what's been happening with new household formation. So that would have roughly meant we'd, we would have seen 150,000 new households being um, created over that one year time period. Uh, it does reduce it to just 29,500 households. So a marked reduction in, in housing demand. Um, again, you know, we don't know what, this is the, the, one of the really big ifs, that the international students and migration, uh, we don't know how long migration will be restricted. Obviously, the longer it goes on, uh, the bigger the impact on new development. Uh, and also it does depend on, on what will happen once borders open again. You know, will, will the government uh, launch a program to try and get higher levels of migration and get that household formation um, numbers back up again? It's still very much an unknown. Uh, some of the other sectors, um, the future of work is, is under uh, considerable change. I think most of us are working from home. It does make life a little bit tricky at times, combining family and, um, and work, but uh, it does seem to be a, a big structural shift that has occurred in the market. Uh, we're not really seeing yet what the full impact of it is. Uh, Mid-year vacancy rates data did obviously go up, but we don't quite know exactly what, what the full impact will be. Uh, potentially, there will be a surge in demand for suburban offices. You know, again, we don't know. Um, there was some speculation a little while back that social distancing may, may save the day, that office um, users would require more space to, to fit people in and allow for social distancing, but that's also looking increasingly unlikely. Um, bigger impacts, though, is, is flying through to CBD. So it's been interesting looking um, today, I was looking at the, the number of shops vacant in CBDs across Australia, and the, there has been a significant lift in shops. Um, that have become vacant over the six month time period, pretty much because people aren't heading into the CBDs at the moment. Um, they're not working there. And, and then we've also got a bit of a vacancy problem, um, residential vacancy problem as well. 
Uh, the issue with shopping centres is also a big one. Um, probably, it has, it's actually been less of a fallout than I expected. I thought shopping centres would have a greater fallout than office and it's been switched around a little bit. Uh, the thing that has been interesting is retail trade uh, has sur did surge back and there is a lot of talk about revenge spending at the moment that what happens when people get out of lockdown is that they like to have some fun and go out and go out and eat at restaurants and go and buy stuff. And, and we certainly saw it in May that after the April lockdown, we saw this massive surge back in retail spending. Uh, it's happening everywhere around the world at the moment. It'll probably happen in Victoria once things open up. And the other trend has been a bit of a bit more rapid shift to online. So again, you know, not surprisingly, people have shopped more online. Uh, I think with retail though, there's, um, there's such a social element to it. So although it will, uh, it will change and there will be a lot of problems with it, uh, it's probably not going to be as catastrophic as, as I think many people expected early on in the, in the pandemic. Uh, the big issue though now is that there is a lot of power in the tenant's hands. So that's been a very big shift, not just in the residential market, but also in commercial property is that tenants are having a much bigger say around how they negotiate leases, also their lease terms and also the rent that they pay. So um, that, that's probably the biggest issue at the moment is that we are seeing a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of discussion and a lot of negotiating between landlords and tenants, uh, which will impact um, rental income for, for landlords going forward. Uh, in terms of COVID safe areas, there's always beneficiaries in, in any downturn. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing, there's some clear, um, clear winners. I mean, Canberra is a market that just hasn't missed a beat since the, the lockdown started. Prices have continued to rise. We're still seeing you know, really solid demand levels in that market. Uh, Perth is actually having its best year from a residential perspective since, you know, since the mining boom really. So, so the Perth market is doing incredibly well. Uh, industrial continuing to do well, but again, was doing pretty well prior to, to lockdowns. Lots and lots of demand for rural and agribusiness. So again, not particularly related to COVID, it might be a little bit food, food security related, but uh, a lot of money does seem to be pumped into to rural and agribusiness and, um, and could also be driven, like, or is likely to also be driven by, by the breaking of the drought. Uh, premium residential mentioned before, and then a lot of activity at the moment in, in regional Australia. So uh, Northern New South Wales, um, Byron Bay region, Southern Gold Coast, uh, very, very strong price growth occurring there at the moment as, as we start to see uh, a lot more buyers. Um, wanting, wanting to be up there, a lot of rental demand as well. And, and also mining towns are, are seeing some pretty incredible growth rates at the moment off, off the back of what we're seeing in the iron ore sector. So I'll finish there and I'll pass back to Abby. Thanks, Nerida, that was great. Um, it's comforting to know that you have a reasonable positive outlook um, on the current economy and that there are some industries and cities that are actually doing quite well. Um, we do have a couple of Q and A's. I might just ask one and um, we can, we'll always revisit them later on if we have time, just conscious of time. Um, one, of it, one, one of the questions is, with the current and foreseeably low interest rates, what does it translate to future property investment and property funds non-banking space? Uh, I probably pass that one on to Wayne. I mean, in terms of what we're seeing with investor activity, um, we, we are continuing to see very low levels for residential. So um, in fact, the lowest level of residential in, uh, investor inquiry that we've ever seen, very different to first home buyer inquiry, which is, which is continuing to surge ahead. Uh, I think though commercial property is, is, is likely to be looking quite different. So, you know, again, I think it's, it's probably sectoral. I think there's still a lot of money around, um, but, I, but I probably would, would leave that for Wayne to discuss in terms of what he's seeing from, from his, um, from his the client. Yeah, no worries. Well, I'll introduce Wayne and I'm sure he'll um, cover it off. So our next panelist, Wayne Lasky, is the founder and managing director of Max Corp Group. He has over 15 years of real estate and finance experience, having worked on all sides of the table as an originator, lender, asset manager, real estate investor and developer, property manager and, and project manager. Wayne, I would be interesting, interested in hearing your thoughts on the economic outlook for Australia. And in particular, what impact do you think COVID-19 will have on the non-bank lending sector? 
Well, thanks, Abby, and uh, good afternoon to um, everyone here on the webinar. Um, I think just to start off, it's, it's really important to identify the non-bank sector, um, you know, we're certainly playing a very key role pre-crisis, um, and that role has been accelerated um, post-crisis, like a lot of trends we're actually seeing have been accelerated through the crisis. And in fact, the non-bank sector is gonna have a very critical role to play um, in our recovery here. And you know, what I mean by that is the seamless transmission of credit to credit worthy borrowers and, um, and commercial real estate assets is fundamentally important. Um, and you know, that, that means that you know, the banking sector, and when I talk about the banks, if we focus in on the main the big four, of course, they're going to play a key role, all right? Um, but their role is diminishing. And to understand why this is the case, we need to go back a little bit in time to, uh, unfortunately, the previous crisis, which was not that long ago, um, being the GFC. And, um, you know, pre-GFC in 2007 and 2008, you know, you had the major banks representing about 60% of commercial real estate lending. Um, you know, sort of put that, you know, into dollar terms, six out of every $10 lent came from the big four. Um, you know, so, you know, when we think about what happened post GFC or through the GFC, really the story is one of structural dislocation. And, and what we saw was consolidation within the banking sector. Very hard to reconcile that um, with a, a deregulation environment that we've been in, you know, through the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, through all the way through the GFC. So you have CBA buying out Bankwest, you have Westpac buying out Sir George and Bank of Melbourne, you've got foreign banks who retreat, you have mortgage trusts suffering from widespread redemptions, and it happened really quickly. And ultimately, that 60% shot up to 85 to 90%. Um, and, you know, that's quite a striking number. Keep in the back of your mind that in the US and UK and continental Europe, the majority of lending for commercial real estate is done by the non-bank sector. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, at the time, the government, of course, supported the idea that, you know, it's critically important to have unquestionably strong banking system. Um, and of course, it was you know deemed to be too big and important to fail. At the end of the day, the four majors are called DCIBs, domestic systemically important banks. I think the GFC proved that. Um, but in the aftermath of the GFC, the Basel Committee on Banking, um, you know, tried to coordinate regulations globally, delivered a number of guidelines, um, really to strengthen international banking with the hopes of avoiding the next GFC. Um, APRA, obviously our prudential regulator, whose primary role is to maintain the safety and soundness of our financial institutions, you know, the big four being um, prime examples thereof. Um, you know, that, that's a function that they're providing so that the community can feel safe, right? That uh, those major banks can meet their financial commitments, you know, in pretty much all reasonable circumstances. So what happened there is they introduced a number of capital benchmarks what was really surprising is just how long it took. It only actually occurred um, in 2017 in earnest. Um, and, you know, much later, as I mentioned, then, you know, US, UK, continental Europe. So what they're doing there is they're requiring the banks to hold more tier one capital on their balance sheet. Um, therein, it's making it particularly difficult for the banks to increase their market share. In fact, of course, it's starting to come down. And, um, you know, I think we can easily understand that it's not particularly healthy, structurally speaking, uh, to have four banks with 85 to 90% of the market share. And you really didn't need to be a fly on the wall at APRA to recognise that, um, you know, their intention was clearly to bring that down to, you know, what is deemed to be market equilibrium. As we understand that, the ceiling on that is about 60%, you know, so pretty much where we were pre-GFC. Um, presently today, the four major banks are... Um, back to about 75% um, of all commercial real estate lending, um, some way off the 60%, and there's a long way to go. But to put all of this into context um, for everyone here on this webinar, you know, we estimate at MaxCap that there is something in the order of a $60 billion funding gap um, emerging, which is 
a function of this regulatory and structural dislocation. Um, and apologies for a little bit of a walk down, um, you know, the, the history path there. But it is important to put it into context to understand well, where does this big gap emerge. Um, certainly, this latest crisis is um, going to necessitate the, uh, a lot more activity from the non-bank sector in order to fill that gap. Um, but in addition to the regulatory intervention, you know, it is really a critical distinction of commercial real estate, you know, to call out that there, there are many and varied sectors. I mean, we've got a highly diverse asset class here. You know, whether we're talking about residential house and land, mid or high rise, we could be talking about um, industrial estates. We could be talking about commercial office. Are we talking hotels? Are we talking retail, discretionary, non-discretionary? Multitude of specialty um, real estate assets. Of course, there's different geographies. There's different real estate trades. You could be acquiring real estate, um, whether that's land, that could be site acquisition. You could be looking to develop. You could be trying to add value, or it could be a longer term core real estate play. Um, and I made myself tired just sort of like reeling all of these things off. But what it does demonstrate is it's nonsensical from a market perspective to think about a one size fits all approach that is pretty much the offer from four majors. Whilst it's critically important offer, it is certainly not um, uh, reflective of a healthy market dynamic. Okay, the market is idiosyncratic, I think is fair to say. So, as I mentioned earlier, of course, you've got the US, UK, um, and, and now continental Europe too, where the majority of lending is done by the non-bank sector. Um, and, and, you know, these trends have just accelerated, as I mentioned um, previously too. So, just quickly, for the benefit of everybody on this call, and those a little less familiar with MaxCap Group, um, I just allow me quickly to um, outline our focus at MaxCap. Uh, we are a vertically integrated fund manager. We specialise in commercial real estate debt, um, as well as direct investment. So that's um, joint venturing and more equity style plays. Um, in simple terms, we originate all of our loan investment opportunities. We structure them through our risk team and we actively manage each investment all the way through to um, successful repayment. So, you know, we've been at that since 2007. Um, you know, we didn't have a blueprint in uh, 2009, so two years after starting the business, we had to navigate through the GFC um, and it feels eerily similar in this instance uh, to go through a crisis where there isn't a playbook um, necessarily. But uh, fortunately enough, got a great team working out of offices in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, Auckland and in uh, Singapore as well. Um, and our investment team is really managing the relationships with borrowers. That's in Australia and New Zealand. So. Um, you know, really need to understand the underlying security. So we have people on the ground and that's focused on Australia and New Zealand. We've um, now up to a little over 340 investments and um, a tad over $9 billion invested um, since inception. And uh, our distribution team on the other side of the equation there is managing relationships with investors globally, as well as domestically. Um, examples being, you know, in the institutional space, your superannuation funds, your pension funds and global insurers and privately it's more like your high net worth individuals, family office and, and multifamily office and the type. So we're currently managing a little over 3.3 billion under management. Um, and I think the thing that gives me the most pleasure to, to um, state is that we've got a, a pristine track record. So that's zero losses over the 14 years. And, and no doubt this crisis is um, going to be challenging everybody, including Max Cap Group to ride through it, um, but we, we remain pretty confident of doing so. And, and that's largely because a lot of our focus is in senior debt. So of the nine billion um, that we've lent, uh, seven and a half of that has been in senior debt and the balance in junior debt and um, equity. So a bit higher up the risk curve there. Um, and those first mortgage loans have delivered a little over 10% um, IRRs since inception. But you know, I would like to just touch on some of those market trends. and. You know, just to the question earlier with regards to, you know, a low interest rate environment and, and, and how does that um, translate? I think, you know, if I'm going to be honest, um, I'd say, well, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to opine just at the minute um, 
you know, I've got a lot of my predictions wrong in the first six months. Um, so it's probably a cause for a pause at this juncture, uh, so as not to look foolish in a month or two's time. But look, clearly low interest rates are gonna get a few people excited. Um, and I, I think what's probably more interesting to me is just the amount of uh, capital washing around the system. Um, and, and what does that mean? Um, now, how many more real estate assets are there, but there's a lot more capital chasing those real estate assets. So um, that's going to be quite interesting in terms of, um, you know, prime real estate. Um, I like the idea of being in prime at this point in time. And I can see values being traded up just by, by the function of the system. Um, with respect to some of the observations, though, in market, uh, you know, Nerit has already touched on the troubles in the commercial office sector. I won't labour the point. Um, she's spot on, um, as usual. And um, I would say that uh, maybe just an example from our end, we, um, we have a very large marquee uh, commercial office development, which is under construction, underpinned with a, a very large cornerstone ASX listed um, tenant. And back in March, the beginning of March, there were eight um, AFLs being uh, negotiated and they were in advanced negotiation, should have been closed in March would have taken that building up to something like 80% um, on, on a pre-commit basis. And I can tell you that only one of those eight have actually been signed. And um, it might surprise anyone on the call, it was a government tenant. Um, so yeah, the, the pain is real at the moment in, in, in that sector. Um, no need really to touch on, on the hotel and accommodation sector. You know, that's, there's not a lot of love for that at the moment, particularly if it's a standalone asset. I think if it's in the context of a mixed use play, there, there's, there's some support for that subject, subject to the, the composition. Um, but, you know, I, I like to always talk a little bit about the resi sector because I think it's um, much maligned. Um, there's a lot of commentary, there's a lot of emotive language regularly used with respect to the resi sector and everyone's keen to stick the boots in pretty quickly. Um, and I think much has been the same case here. And I think what hasn't been getting a lot of airtime really is two fundamental uh, um, uh, issues at play pre-crisis. And that is, you know, we were in a very large undersupply um, coming into this crisis. In fact, it was my own personal view that the big story of 20. Uh, late, late 2021 was going to be Australia's massive housing undersupply crisis. Well, um, lucky I didn't go and predict that, as it turns out. But, um, uh, but of course, there's been an absolute um, drop in terms of the supply. So new housing starts have fallen off the edge of a cliff. Um, what, what is interesting, though, is also we had in Melbourne and Sydney uh, a pretty profoundly felt pricing downturn. You might recall um, around about the time of the, the Royal Commission in, um, into the banks. So both of those fundamental changes have helped um, us absorb some of these early impacts from the crisis in the residential sector. And I think, you know, touching on the population story, Nerit and I, I think, um, have discussed this in the past. And, you know, I think we're of slightly different views, which is really healthy. And again, we're forecasting and that's dangerous at any time. Um, but... Uh, she's spot on when she says it's 1.4% per annum um, that we've been growing. In fact, that's a historical average for the past 40 years in Australia in terms of the growth in population. And that is the number one in the Western world. So let's put that into context. So when we talk about population growth, we have to understand just the magnitude of the population growth that we've had in this country. Um, and in fact, in the last 15 years, that's been more like 1.65%. Um, now, when I think about it, I, I, I say to myself, just be aware about the immediacy bias. Okay, yes, of course, people can't come into the country right now. Okay, but why did people want to come to Australia? And have those reasons changed? And I would proffer that, yeah, they have. They've actually improved for all the reasons that anyone wanted to come to Australia. It ought to be recognised that we're an island, right? with a hell of a lot of land for social distancing, um, with world-class healthcare, 
And in fact, I also believe an economy that is going to recover, relatively speaking, better than most other Western economies, and with a very low, uh, again, relatively speaking, uh, net debt to GDP to allow us to stimulate recovery. So I think that's important always to keep in mind. And, and the other um, stat I might throw out there is we think about... Um, what, Wayne, sorry to interrupt, might, might just wrap up with maybe a closing comment, just conscious sure. of time. I know you've got plenty of important um, insights to share. I will, so close, to do that. I will close on the resi sector. Yeah, um, sure. And what I would say is the other question I'm most often asked is with regards to settlements in market. And uh, we have just settled uh, four very large transactions in the past uh, three weeks now, which represent a little over 1,500 apartments. And the default rate there was less than 3%. You know, within um, really very close to the historical average and a very immaterial amount of default. So it is a very resilient market at the moment. That's not to suggest that, it, that that's a flat line or a straight line that can be drawn from there into 21. Um, but it is an incredibly, uh, and shocking to me, like very pleasingly surprised in terms of performance today. Thanks, Wayne. No, that was great. Um, the 60 billion funding gap that you mentioned, that's, that's quite large. And I think you're right to say that uh, one size fits all model is not ideal. Um, and we want a lending market that can sort of cater for different asset classes. Um, so it's probably a good time to introduce Lawrence who um, can bring us a perspective from the property side, um, being a property fund manager. So our final panelist, Lawrence Copping, is the co-founder of Eagle Property Group. Um, so he's gonna get a feedback there. And Crest Funds Management. Established in 2012 and originally intended as an investment vehicle for its founders and their close associates, the company now has an investor base that includes private individuals, family trusts, family offices, self-managed super funds and institutions. Hi Lawrence, thanks for joining us today. Um, to get things underway, can you tell us a little bit about the type of property assets Eagle Property acquire? Hi Abby, thank you. So we've all heard the line in the movie, uh, you know, that uh, uh, if you build it, they will come. So we, we go, we went exactly the opposite and, and, and we proffer that uh, if you fix it, they will stay. So uh, what we do is we look for properties that were once institutional grade properties. They've uh, unloved and uh, we, we buy them and we apply a, a repositioning strategy uh, grow income and uh, hopefully uh, at the end of that strategy uh, exit them at peak valuation. That's great um, and in terms of sourcing debt I think it would be great um, if you're willing to share with the audience your experience with respect to sourcing debt in the current market. Um, have you found debt easy to secure and in fact um, do you utilize mm. debt or are you more heavily um, into raising equity? So Abby, we've uh, uh, we really uh, uh, balance the, the the debt requirements to the, the strategy to, to the specific property and and, and the, uh, the strategy that we're going to be uh, implementing. So uh, we're very very conservative with debt. So uh, we uh, and and on top of that, we always raise the capital upfront to execute the repositioning strategy. So we haven't had any problem to date with, uh, with debt and the level of debt also then differs with, uh, uh, with, with the, the strategy of uh, the, the, the acquisition and the, and the repositioning strategy. But, but the debt space is changing. I think, uh, you, you know, Wayne will, will be the first one to, uh, uh, to give us some insight into that. And uh, I think it's becoming harder uh, and companies new to bank, I think are, gonna are finding it increasingly difficult, if not impossible to, uh, to get debt. Uh, so, uh, so I think we, we've been okay, uh, but I think that's because of our uh, very risk averse conservative uh, structures that we, that we uh, utilize. 
Um, so you mentioned repositioning assets. Um, that's sort of a little bit away from your core, just holding of property assets. Is this an area that you see sort of non-bank lending fitting in? I think so. I think so. I think the, the, the challenge for, for in the, in the non-bank lending space may actually be the opportunity. Uh, the challenge I think is pricing, but the opportunity is flexibility. You know, in, certainly in our space, in the repositioning space, uh, the equity, equity release is a big, uh, a big area. And, and what I'm alluding to is you buy a building, it's very distressed, you spend some money, and you get some some wins in terms of your leasing efforts, and uh, and, and and at milestones, if if, uh, if there's a, a lender that is flexible enough and, and understands that, and you can put some kind of a uh, an equity release structure in place, I think that the non-bank lenders are far are far better placed than the uh, mainstream banks for that. Uh, then the other metrics, interest cover ratios. Loan to value ratios, I, th I think pricing for risk, and I, I think there's flexibility and nimbleness that the non bank lenders have that the mainstream banks don't have. Wayne, I'd be interested in your thoughts on um, where you think non bank lending fits in. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, Lawrence is outlining is right. If you're looking at um, you know, a stable asset uh, and you're, you're wanting to get three-year money, um, the Australian banks are still going to be the cheapest form of debt. Uh, that's their sweet spot. Um, but pretty much everything outside of that, uh, you know, is, is quickly becoming the domain of the non-bank sector. And, you know, price is always relevant. But what we've found, particularly during... Um, the borrower's highest order requirement is the certainty of funding. Um, so yes, flexibility is important in terms of terms. How quickly can we start? How flexible are we? Whether or condition subsequent. Sorry, sorry, Lawrence. I might just get you to mute. Um, it's a little bit of feedback just while Wayne's talking. Thanks. Sorry, Wayne. No problem. So yeah, what I was saying there is that pricing is certainly relevant um, and the flexibility is certainly relevant uh, as well. But you know, I, I think fundamentally what borrowers want is a certainty of capital so that uh, they know that when the term sheet is issued, that it will be followed up with a facility agreement. And of course, what is often happening during these crisis events is that term sheets are being pulled by banks or they're being materially altered um, late in the game, and that is really worrying a lot of borrowers at the moment, and and um, should borrow, bother everyone really, including myself, because as I said, we do need that seamless transmission of credit. Um, we might actually just pause for a second there and um, launch our poll number two, just because it's relevant to this particular um, discussion point. Hopefully it'll be coming up on your screen soon. Lawrence, while um, people are answering that um, poll, um, one interesting point with respect to uh, property funds managers is, do you, do you think that the non-bank lenders are competing with you now in sourcing investment opportunities? Um, do you see it as an investment that might get more interest from investors in the future? Abby, we, uh, at, at one stage we did. Uh, you must remember that uh, up until uh, the recent COVID events, our sector, the, the uh, value-add sector, was probably the most over overpriced sector. People were pricing in uh, eighty percent of the value add was priced into the uh, into the price, and uh, and a lot of our investors, at, uh, in parallel with that, were being offered uh, uh, to invest into these debt products. So so uh, so so yes, on the one hand they were, but I think there, there's a, a lot more risk is now. 
uh, inherent in some of these debt products with uh, with uh, sponsors that, that don't necessarily understand the the uh, property component and the risks uh, the risk component to it. And, and I think uh, certainly in the value add space, I think that uh, pricing I I is moderating, and it's it's being uh, it's being marked marked back to its, its, its true value. So, so I think that, uh, that there's, there's more than enough space uh, on, on both sides of the, uh, of the coin. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, and we did get a question in that was relevant to some of the discussion both between yourself and Wayne before. Um, and the question was, do, do non-bank lenders allow equity release for commercial property transactions? So it might be more for you, Wayne. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think the, the very simple answer um, is, and not to talk on every non-bank lender's behalf, but um, really our investment philosophy is, is quite simple. Um, we want a high quality uh, borrower uh, with an exceptionally strong piece of real estate. Um, everything else can be negotiated and discussed. Um, it's, it's the simplest and shortest answer. Abby, I hope that helps. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for that, Wayne. Um, I've just got one other question, probably more so for you, Nerida. Um, is the level of government funding going to be a major issue in the future, do you think? Uh, so government debt. I think oh, sorry, government, government debt. debt. Yeah, <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Um, yeah, look, I, of course it is. I mean, that does have to be paid back at some stage. I think, well, you know, the, the really big risk is that we have another event like this and, you know, we've, and it's far worse and we, you know, we're not adequately funded in the same way that we went into it this time. So, you know, you can always think of a more and more doom and gloom scenario at any stage, but... You know, I think there, there has been a lot of discussion around things like modern monetary policy, you know, to, to account for this. And, um, and that, that discussion wouldn't have happened 12 months ago. So, yeah, I think at this stage, not too many people are worried about government debt, but at some stage we are going to have to um, consider how we pay it back. Yep, there's a few more questions coming in. Um, is it harder to find high quality borrowers in the current market? Um, Wayne, did you want to answer that or Lawrence or yeah. whoever? Well, look, I, I think it's important to note that there are a lot of borrowers who have been executing business plans um, on assets, whether they're assets in transition or whether they're um, full development plays, um, where most of the business plan was executed pre-crisis and you're actually moving into financial close on those um, investments now. Uh, so the answer would be, well, no, it's not particularly difficult at the moment, um, but will it be harder into the future with softer conditions and potentially a more challenging environment to get requisite pre-leasing, pre-sales um, away? Uh, well, I think the answer would be, you'd have to expect it will become harder, yes. Um, and there's just another one for you, Wayne. Um, do you see income contracting in the office sector? And if so, if so, capital values will contract, leading to LVR stress? Yeah, question I've been getting a lot of. Um, look, I, I think what we want to be watching out for here is, you know, at the moment, there haven't been enough trades. Um, so... By that, I mean there aren't enough comparables in market. Because of that, um, there really haven't been revaluations done widespread. Um, and therefore, you know, by extension of that, if I understood the question correctly, there haven't been um, the sort of stress in market. Uh, will that happen? Um, yeah, look, I, I think it's a combination of what Nerida and Lawrence were saying earlier, you know, like, Lawrence is right. There are, um, as there always uh, will be in crisis, um, there'll, there'll be um, landlords or there'll be uh, developers who pay too much for an asset at a point in time, who find it particularly difficult to execute their business plan um, through uh, 
you know, 21 and 22. Um, and there will be uh, revaluations in all likelihood in some um, sectors. And we've mentioned some of the obvious ones that are under the most stress. Um, they're coming. Um, but at the same time, there is a tremendous amount of investor appetite for distressed um, plays. And, you know, I can tell you those investors are circling. Um, but, you know, to date, they're getting pretty frustrated and bored, as they often do in the Australian marketplace, because we just don't tend to get the, the widespread distress, at least we haven't for the last three decades. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Narada, you did mention bill to rent. Um, I think that's an area that's becoming in increasingly popular in Australia. It's obviously well developed um, in other parts of the world, particularly in the UK. Um, I know there are some tax impediments, particularly um, when you're looking for foreign investment with respect to the bill to rent structure. Um, despite these impediments, do you see this as a um, growth sector? Yeah, look, it, it does seem to be a growth sector. I mean, when you talk to a lot of developers, um, I'd say most of them are looking at it as, a, as an alternative to the, the build to sell model. Uh, you know, there's lots of, as you said, there's lots of issues around whether it can work in Australia and the big one being that Australian yields are, you know, incredibly low. So trying to get a return is, is quite difficult. Uh, there's tax impediments that don't apply to the build to sell sector. So, you know, there's a lot of taxation, complicated taxation issues that, that need to be resolved. Uh, I think though, what, what is interesting is that, you know, we are seeing incredibly low levels of um, investor demand for residential housing at the moment. So uh, if we have a look at who provides residential uh, rental housing, it is overwhelmingly mum and dad investors. I think, you know, you take out a government, it's pretty much 100%. So it's, um, if we do have this wholesale reduction in the number of mum and dad investors in the market, at some stage we will have quite a significant shortage of, of rental housing and, and that's likely to turn up in a couple of years and at that stage we will start to see quite a, a flow of build to rent projects completing. So, you know, I think, I think the timing now is quite good for a lot of build to rent projects to get started and, and primarily because of that in low level, those low levels of investor activity. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, we might just launch um, our final poll. Um, and while we're sort of, yep, it's up there now. Um, while we're waiting for people to answer that, um, Nerida, I think it would be good um, to end on a positive note, um, particularly for us Victorians who are in lockdown. Um, what do you think that we can be positive about um, looking into the future? Uh, look, I think today's employment numbers were overwhelmingly positive. If you have a look at the amount, number of jobs that have come back now in the rest of Australia, they are looking quite different. Um, we, we have seen strong bounce back in every other capital city now that has come out of lockdown. Uh, that will happen in Melbourne. Uh, and then I think too, uh, distress, or, or not distress, but certainly problems in the property market are, are very, um, is very targeted, like they just, there's not widespread distress in the market. They, there just seems to be some parts of the market that are, that are struggling at the moment. And they are struggling primarily because foreign students aren't coming back in a hurry at, at this time. And also that when, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty with what will happen with migration levels. So, you know, I think, I think once a lot of that uncertainty is resolved, it will be quite different. And I think too, the other thing too, is that we've, we've pumped in this incredible level of economic stimulus into the economy and, uh, interest rates are at record low levels and, you know, once, once activity and once productivity starts again, we could be in for a very, very sharp recovery. And uh, if we have a look at, you know, housing is obviously a market that I'm, I'm looking at most at the moment, but, you know, we could see a, a rapid acceleration in house pricing once, once this, um, you know, once all these restrictions end. And I think at that stage, it'll be a matter of trying to unwind all this growth that, that has been, that will suddenly occur. Thanks, Nerida. Um, unfortunately, we're probably going to have to wrap it up there. I did know that there's some um, Q&As that haven't been answered. I'm sure the panellists would be happy um, if you wanted to reach out to them to get those answered. Um, I'm going to introduce Paul Healy while I just um, get all the poll results so that I can share it with you shortly. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's been a great pleasure uh, participating in this today. And I would... Um, just as these uh, poll questions are gathered and they'll be published very shortly, 
I'd like to uh, express my sincere appreciation to um, Nerida, Wayne and Lawrence for your valuable insights this afternoon. Um, enormously insightful, so thank you so much for the time you've given to us. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Shine Wing hosting today, um, particularly to Abby, thank you so much for moderating so professionally, and to the team who you haven't seen, to Rachel, to Lucy from Shine Wing, who've done all of the, um, the grunt work in the production, and to my colleagues from the PFA, to Nicole and Deborah, thank you so much for putting it all together today. So uh, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at future events um, as we work our way through these very difficult times. But I'm an optimist, and I'm sure there's a lot of good light at the end of the tunnel. So I'll just refer back to Abby now to publish the poll results and I'll sign off and thank you so much for your attendance. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, so for the first question that we had, um, which was, do you or your clients currently use non-bank lending for your businesses? Um, we actually had a, a, quite a high percentage, 75% of people said that they already do. Um, with 24% saying no. Um, and the second question, which was, do you think that COVID-19 means that more property owners will have to rework their portfolios? 73% uh, said yes, and 9% said no. Um, I think that's not surprising given what we've heard today about the various um, asset classes and how they're performing. Um, and finally, the last question was, do you think that more property owners will consider non-bank lending post COVID-19? Um, and that was pretty similar to the first um, question being 78% yes, um, but probably a, a few less percentage saying no, only 5%. So I think that's quite promising for the non-bank lending sector. So um, I might just pass it back to Paul to conclude today's uh, presentation. Okay, well, very interesting poll results there. So um, it's lovely that there's always differing opinions. So um, we are just about out of time, 4.59. We like to run these things on time. So again, thank you to everybody for, uh, for participating today. And I'll wish you a very pleasant afternoon. And thank you for your attendance.